China has ascended to the world's second largest economy through the greatest 40-year run in economic history. China's GDP grew by more than 9% per year from 1980 to 2019. And during that time, more than 800 million people were lifted out of extreme poverty. But the good times may be coming to an end. The capital that funded China's growth is drying up. The energy that powered its manufacturing is getting more expensive. And the unfettered growth of its real estate market has hit a brick wall. China's economy faces the most ominous challenges since the Great Leap Forward that resulted in three years of famine and tens of millions of deaths. But China's geopolitical rivals should not be celebrated. It is the top trading partner for more than 120 of the world's 195 countries, which means trouble in the Middle Kingdom can and will affect everyone. In this video, we'll be unpacking the enormous debt bubble that Chinese leadership is attempting to unwind the challenging global energy market conditions making things worse, and the most likely policy choice that the CCP must make in order to stay solvent. But if the Chinese economy is a Ponzi scheme poised to pop, then we need to first understand the four-decade hot streak that preceded the present day. China's remarkable economic growth story begins in the 1970s, when Deng Xiaoping initiated a series of economic reforms known as reform and opening up. This marked a significant shift from the centrally planned economy that defined China's history under communism. But he knew that he couldn't completely turn a communist country into a capitalist one and still maintain control. So he limited the open market forces to four special economic zones. In these fenced off areas, trade was conducted in a more market oriented system, encouraging foreign investment, private entrepreneurship, in global trade. These special economic zones were wildly successful, and China experienced its first explosion of growth in the early 1980s. Villages turned to metropolises. Agriculture became more productive, and standards of living rose. Places like Shenzhen became manufacturing powerhouses. It also began to fill the Chinese balance sheet, as most of the companies that flourished were state-owned enterprises. SOEs are firms where the state owns a significant or majority share of the company. They often receive subsidies, low-cost credit, and preferential regulatory treatment from the government in order to succeed in strategic sectors such as energy, telecommunications, transportation, and finance. They're also required to abide by government mandates and public policy objectives, like employment quotas. The CCP found a model where they could funnel profits from private industry into their centrally planned worldview. And if those companies could access global capital markets, all bets were off. Which leads us to the second pivotal moment in China's economic ascent, joining the World Trade Organization in 2001. The World Trade Organization agreement to adopt the draft decision on the accession of the People's Republic of China. By committing to WTO standards for reducing tariffs, increasing transparency, and protecting intellectual property rights, they were able to further integrate itself into the global economy and attract even more foreign investment. In the years following China joining the WTO, foreign direct investment grew rapidly. In 2002, inflows were around $53 billion, and by 2008, they'd reached $108 billion. As hundreds of millions of Chinese saw their wages increase, their capital flowed into banks. This accelerated China's investment-led growth model, as China's banking system operates through window guidance, where banks are instructed by the government on lending quotas rather than market forces. This has led to rampant overinvestment, fueling an unsustainable property bubble. The CCP has greenlit massive infrastructure projects, promoted urbanization of what were once villages, and developed numerous export-oriented industries. All that construction and manufacturing relies on energy imports. As the world's largest energy consumer, China's energy mix is dominated by fossil fuels. In addition to approving two new coal power plants for construction every week, China is also the world's largest crude oil importer. They import over 10 million barrels of crude per day. That's more than the United States and India combined. 
As a result, today China sits on a perilous balancing act of using debt to finance growth, needing healthy export markets to accept their goods, and being reliant on global energy markets to keep their manufacturing businesses sustainable. Now let's talk about real estate. In the early stages of implementing an investment-led growth strategy, a little bit of extra debt is okay. Loans used to build a highway connecting major metros, or building an airport in a mid-sized city, unlocks economic growth. But eventually, you need to transition to a consumption-led economy, where the wealth of your population and their demand for goods and services can fuel your growth. If that doesn't happen, then central planners need to keep rolling investments into worse and worse opportunities. That looks like roads leading to nowhere, a second airport in that mid-sized city, and enormous real estate development projects without tenants. China has built an excessive amount of housing. With a population around 1 billion, the country has enough vacant homes to house up to 3 billion people. There are approximately 7.2 million unsold homes. Yet that doesn't even account for sold but uncompleted properties or homes purchased as investments but intentionally left vacant. Excessive construction has led to entire neighborhoods of high-rise residential complexes sitting empty, with some provinces facing completion timelines of over 20 years for unfinished projects. That's why Chinese real estate is worth at best, one-tenth of its current price. That may be an underestimation, but it's certainly not an exaggeration. And this is a symptom of their investment-led, export-reliant system. The Chinese business model doesn't really work if you're rewarding all your workers with higher wages, as that would hurt Chinese exports. So the easiest way for households to participate in Chinese wealth creation has been through the real estate market. Lever up, buy properties, those prices go up, everybody's happy. That's one of the reasons property accounts for over 60% of Chinese household wealth versus just 23% in the United States. As a result, the real estate sector has accounted for around 29% of China GDP. Compare that to the US, where housing combined contribution to GDP generally averages 15 to 18% per year. Now, Chinese leadership is aware of the problem. And recently, Xi Jinping applied a clampdown to the property sector with the intent to send a message. China is about common prosperity and paper wealth creation shouldn't get out of hand. To curb excesses in the real estate sector, the government has implemented policies such as three red lines to limit borrowing by property developers. But it turns out you can't unwind a $50 trillion real estate bubble in an orderly manner. This could easily trigger the biggest balance sheet recession in modern history. Here's how that would work. When house prices start dropping, this hits the balance sheet of highly indebted households and developers, causing them to sell properties to repair their balance sheet. But nobody wants new mortgages when they are busy repairing and paying off their debts. The lack of buyers coincides with lenders starting to tighten their standards for giving out a mortgage. This hits house prices further in a vicious loop known as a balance sheet recession. China is currently cutting interest rates, but it's unlikely to work because demand for that credit just isn't there. Everyone knows that housing is overpriced, and Xi has said he's not stepping in to prop things up. With rates dropping in China while the U.S. Federal Reserve has avoided cutting, interest rate differentials are widening. This means pressure on the yuan, China's currency, is building. For the last two decades, the People's Bank of China has held the yuan in a relatively stable mark against the US dollar, which is called a managed float system. This managed float allows China to maintain a competitive exchange rate for its exports. China is trying to defend that $7.20 level, but a few cracks are already appearing. Why does this matter? Well, Chinese capital controls and their relatively small capital market means that the weakness in the property sector remains isolated to China for now. But China is a big investor in some other countries, and that money is going to dry up. This could be trouble for Australia, Brazil, and everyone getting money through the Belt and Road Initiative. Some are still holding out hope that the CCP will inject more money into the system and try to reinflate. But messaging and policy has actually indicated the opposite. Investment-led growth 
has run its course. But this slowdown will not only impact the property market, it's going to have ripple effects throughout the Chinese economy, particularly construction, cement, and steel. In Argentina and Turkey, inflation is out of control. In places like the US and Germany, inflation is embedded in a political hot button. But in China, deflation is a whole lot scarier. This means a housing collapse, where the Chinese middle class gets its wealth wiped out. At the same time, if development projects get shut down, enormous portions of the workforce will be unemployed. So the government needs to invest in other sectors of the economy to try and keep some portion of the house of cards standing. It's hard to measure exactly how much investment is required, but China experts like Brian McCarthy estimate they must be near a 10% annual growth rate to avoid economic collapse. This would require around $5 trillion of new credit issuance per year, which would inevitably lead to oversupply in the export-driven industries the government prioritizes. If the CCP is set on success in electric vehicles, it won't wait around for the market to produce some EV companies. Instead, they'll invite foreign EV companies to manufacture their cars in China for preferential rates, then steal as much of their IP as possible. With that, they'll seed dozens of EV companies with government subsidies and cheap loans through banks. Those companies will compete to the death within China for dominance. The survivor will become a national champion that is too big to fail due to geopolitical significance, employment of the population, and national prestige. Unfortunately, along the way, the subsidies and cheap loans will lead to the overproduction of that targeted good. While the Chinese population's wealth has been growing and they can consume some of this production, a balance sheet recession means that the majority of this is going to have to be exported. And we can see this oversupply in the export data. Chinese steel exports are surging, up by over 40 million tons. Passenger vehicle exports have surged to over 5 million cars a year. In other sectors like batteries, Chinese capacity is four times domestic demand. Chinese capacity for solar panels exceeds even the most optimistic estimates for global demand. So when these huge supplies reach another country's shores, leaders find themselves in a conundrum. Should we allow our population to buy these cheap goods? Consumers will be happy. And if it's cheap t-shirts, then who cares, right? But what about key technology products that decimate local companies who can't produce them as cheaply? WTO members like the US, India, and Brazil all employ tariffs on the import of foreign cars. The EU protects agriculture, steel, and chemical industries. These are all industries that China's central planners have targeted because of their strategic significance. Even one of China's partners in BRICS is getting concerned. If China's manufacturers can't find markets abroad to sell into, then its economic miracle is over. Now, before we get into the challenges of China's energy security, we need to talk about why the exact date of economic collapse is going to be impossible to predict. The Chinese government operates a totalitarian one-party state. If you live in a democracy with two or more parties, the dynamics of an economic crisis is quite different. Basically, the electorate kicks out the ruling party of power. But in a one-party state, there's no such release valve. A genuine economic crisis means that people start marching in the streets. So they will literally do anything to avoid that scenario. Everything that can be kicked down the road will be kicked until it can't be kicked any further. One of the steps to prevent collapse is to muddy the information environment. Some folks watching this video might even say, that's not what the data says. China's economy is growing and unemployment is low. Ask that person, how do you know that? See, for the last decade, China has been slowly removing access to data about the Chinese economy. Today, access from outside China to all economic databases has been completely cut off including corporate information on Hong Kong and mainland companies. No customs data, no financial information whatsoever. They cut off customs data access in 2018. In 2021 alone, Chinese customs reported $400 billion more than the State Administration of Foreign Exchange did. Data streams like WIND, the most expensive database used by the universities and hedge funds, 
can now only be accessed by trusted IP sites within mainland China. But even those data streams keep disappearing. As outside observers, we have to evaluate this at a meta level. Are they hiding weakness or concealing strength? Back when the industrialist John D. Rockefeller was conquering the oil market, he had a highly persuasive move when attempting to acquire one of his competitors. He kept meticulous records of his company's operations, including costs, profits, and production volumes. When competitors tried to challenge Standard Oil, Rockefeller would sometimes invite them to his office and show them his books. The sheer size and profitability of Standard Oil, as documented in Rockefeller's records, often demoralized his rivals. Many realized they could not hope to compete with the scale and efficiency of Rockefeller's operation. Some chose to sell their business to Standard Oil rather than try to compete. This strategy contributed to Rockefeller's ability to consolidate the oil industry and build Standard Oil into a powerful monopoly. If Xi Jinping's economy was firing on all cylinders, wouldn't he want the world to know? Wouldn't that help him secure more cheap financing for domestic companies and demoralize Indo-Pacific competitors into joining his Belt and Road Initiative? The 2024 National People's Congress announced that their target is 5% GDP growth with inflation targeted at 3%. The Premier's work report suggests all problems will be solved and the government will be restrained in terms of stimulus. And by some means or another, the reported data will officially say 5% GDP growth. Don't buy it. Hey, do you find this interesting? Please leave a like if you do. It really helps with the algorithm. Thanks. In order to have a chance of hitting those GDP targets, China will need a lot of energy. It is already the world's largest energy consumer and growth requires energy. Most of China's domestic oil production occurs in its northeastern provinces. However, the Daiking, Shengli, and Laohe oil fields have been declining in recent years due to the depletion of mature oil fields and the increasing complexity of exploiting remaining reserves. It seems their domestic crude production has topped out around 4 million barrels per day, leaving a substantial gap to be filled by imports. China imports approximately 70% of its crude oil, with Saudi Arabia, Russia, Iraq, and Angola being their biggest suppliers. This heavy reliance on foreign oil leaves China vulnerable to supply disruptions and price volatility. Any geopolitical events affecting these key suppliers or disruptions of critical shipping routes, such as the Strait of Malacca, could have severe consequences for China's energy security. A sudden increase in global energy prices would exacerbate China's economic challenges, leading to its increased production costs and affecting overall economic stability. And the probability of this is increasing. Ukraine is targeting oil refineries as part of their attempt to slow the Russian war machine. As Iranian proxies attack Israel, their oil assets become an increasingly appealing target. Additionally, Venezuela, Libya, Nigeria, and Guyana all face increasingly unstable geopolitical situations that could impact international oil markets. China's backing of Russia in the Ukraine war should have triggered Beijing to lock down energy production in Southeast Asia and the Persian Gulf in anticipation of rising energy insecurity. Instead, Xi's government started importing Russian crude en masse. This means China has collected the world's second largest strategic petroleum reserve in the world after the United States. Although the exact size of China's reserve is not officially disclosed, various estimates from energy analysts suggested to be around 550 million barrels. That would only cover 90 days of consumption. China is one major energy shock away from its debt deflation going non-linear. So what happens when a $50 trillion debt bubble comes apart? Well, for one, the banks are in trouble. They're the ones that originated a majority of these loans, and they hold a bunch of them on their balance sheet. China has the four largest banks in the world. These state-owned enterprises are all larger than JP Morgan. The Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, the world's largest bank, has a loan portfolio of over 3.5 trillion, with a significant portion tied to the real estate sector. The China Construction Bank, the Agricultural Bank of China, and the Bank of China also have substantial exposure to property loans. As state-owned entities, 
these banks face an impossible trade-off during a debt deflation scenario. A collapse in lending activity would lead to widespread business failures and job losses, exacerbating the economic slowdown. So they'll be pressured to continue lending. But stacking worse and worse loans onto their balance sheets will eventually wipe out the equity of these banks. Shareholders, particularly offshore investors, will find their capital erased as the CCP tries to fill the gaping hole in the national balance sheet. After that, they will recapitalize the banks, but not before wiping out equity holders. But it's not limited to the banks. Shadow banking has added fuel to the real estate bubble. Trust loans and wealth management products have been used to circumvent regulations on traditional bank lending, allowing developers to access credit even as the formal banking system tightens. These products often have higher interest rates and shorter maturities, making them even more vulnerable to a downturn in the property market. As defaults rise, the opaque nature of these products and their interconnectedness with the formal banking system could amplify the effects of a debt deflation scenario. This is a wicked setup. Property prices falling, leading to all sorts of defaults and foreclosures, means that these banks and shadow banks can only acquire the properties that they were financing. But they can't sell those properties. This path will be painful no matter when it happens or who it hits first. Policymakers are staring down the barrel of an economic depression, and there's really only one lever they can pull. A sharp devaluation of the yuan might be the only escape valve for the central planners of the Chinese economy. By dropping the ratio of yuan to USD from 7 to 10 or 12, they would effectively inflate away some of the country's debt by reducing the real value of outstanding liabilities. This would make it easier for borrowers to service their debts and mitigate the risk of widespread defaults. And they've done a small dose of this before. In 2015, they did a 3% devaluation. The issue is that US dollar reserves held by the government and private companies would evaporate. This is because their yuan wouldn't go as far in international markets. That makes importing energy, food, and all their industrial inputs more expensive. At the same time, it wouldn't necessarily help their exports. They're already getting accused of dumping goods, and tariffs across the board are ramping up. A drop in the cost of Chinese exports would likely just be met with higher tariffs. A Chinese economy with exploding inflation, shrinking wealth, and energy insecurity is a sinking ship. If they choose this path, CCP policymakers would have to act quickly as a devaluation of the yuan would also trigger capital flight, where wealthy individuals seek to move their assets out of China to protect against the currency depreciation. A rapid bail-in to save the banks, devalue the yuan, and peg to gold could eventually restore confidence. But in the interim, global financial markets would face extreme volatility. Germany, Australia, and Brazil would be hit particularly hard by such a shock. We will be monitoring the situation closely on this channel, and you can expect additional updates as things progress. In the meantime, watch our video about Argentina to study a country on a very different trajectory than China.